Distinguished uh, guests, Honorable Assistant Minister of the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Economic Relations of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mr. Reof Hajibegic, Honorable State Councillor for Climate Change of the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning of Republic of Macedonia, uh, Dr. Teodora Obradovic Goncharovska, Honorable Member of European Parliament and Chair of International Scientific Committee of the Conference, Professor Maria de Grasa Carvalho, uh, Honorable uh, Prefect of the Dubrovnik Neretva County, Mr. Nikola Dobroslavic, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture, University of Zagreb, Professor Ivan Juraga, uh, Chair of Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. Ivo Schlaus, Distinguished members of the International Scientific Committee, Scientific Advisory Board, Programming Committee, Special Session Programming Committee, Poster Session Programming Committee, Award Committee, Keynote and Panel Programming Committee, Special Issue Programming Committee, Summer School Programming Committee, Sponsors and Partners, Special Session Organizers, Invited Plenary Lecturers, Panelists, Session Chairs and Co-Chairs, session keynotes, members of the uh, Cent International Center for Sustainable Development uh, uh, of Energy, Water and Environment Systems, speakers and participants, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you uh, in the name of the organizing committee to the 8th Conference on Sustainable Development of Energy, Water and Environment Systems. This opening uh, session will be chaired by uh, 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 the Chair of uh, International Scientific Committee, Professor Maria de Grasa Carvalho, uh, the Chair of the Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. Ivo Schlaus, the Secretary of the Conference, Professor Zvonimir Guzovic, and me, uh, Nevin Duic, Chair of uh, the Local Organizing Committee. This session is uh, uh, going online. Uh, it is streamed, so if you go to the website of the conference, uh, you can send the link to your uh, family members all over the world and they can uh, participate with you today uh, in this opening session. There will be streaming uh, of uh, most of plenary sessions and also some other sessions uh, during the conference. Uh, I would like to thank especially those that helped this conference happen by giving financial support. Croatian Ministry of Science, Education and Sports. Uh, our gold uh, partner, C Energy Plus, uh, which is a network of national contact points for energy work program of the Framework Program 7, uh, European Union's Framework Program 7, as well as our silver uh, partner, Jülich Forschungszentrum. I would also like to thank publishers and editors in chief of the journals that have already announced special issues like Elsevier's Energy, Applied Energy. Journal uh, for, of Cleaner Production, as well as uh, 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 Energy Conversion and Management, Thermal Science, Management of Envi Environmental Quality, International Journal of Progress in Industrial <laughs> Ecology, in the, uh, International Journal of Agricultural Resources, Governance and Ecology, Journal of Sustainable Development of Energy, Water uh, and Environment Systems, and that others which are still in negotiations. Uh, hosting such uh, an event is a great privilege, but uh, even greater responsibility. Organization is uh, complex and challenging and requires a lot of enthusiasm and dedication. But the benefits and contributions at international and national level are much higher and noteworthy. First of all, due to the topics this conference deals with, sustainable development with all its intertwined areas, we are uh, more interconnected and interlinked than ever. We share the planet, which is becoming a global village. We share the responsibility to protect it for future generations. As an old proverb says, we did not inherit Earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. In order to respond to this challenge, the sustainable development requires using the best scientific and traditional knowledge available. Furthermore, the development process should be constantly re-evaluated in light of the findings of scientific research to ensure that resource utilization has reduced impacts on the Earth systems. Even so, the future is uncertain 
and there will be surprises. Good environmental and developmental management policies must therefore be scientifically robust, seeking to keep open a range of options to ensure flexibility of responses. In this line, our role as scientists is to provide information to enable better formulation and selection of environment and development policies in the decision-making process. In order to fulfill this requirement, it will be essential to enhance scientific understanding, improve long-term scientific assessment, strengthen scientific capacities in all countries and ensure that the sciences are responsive to emerging needs. But we should also go beyond interpreting the world. The point is to change it. Before we start, I would like to invite the founder of uh, this conference, Professor Naim Afghan, to give us insight into the history, presence, and future of sustainability. Professor, the floor is yours. Professor Duic, thank you very much for your introduction. But you see, I decided to say something what goes behind the scene. We haven't seen that in the, in, in the conference up to now. So that my presentation will be devoted to the specifically sustainability, because the, this buzzy word Sustainability has been around the world for almost 20 years. And if you listen to people from different branches, science, techno technology, political people, they use sustainability all the time. And if you will try to ask them, do they understand what they really means sustainability, very few of them will give you a good answer. So that Sustainability is one of those buzzy words which has been going around the world for from the very early days, but that was discovered by United Nations, and that's the reason why United Nations has formed a commission for economy and environment, and they devoted very, very much of, the, of their no, that's good. Uh, of their effort to that. And one of the leading persons in this, in defining what the sustainability is, is me. Let me now move to, the, to my slides. Okay, here is something I want to, uh, to give you the first step. Is that, uh, that the, this idea of the, is developed from, as I said, from the United Nations, but taken by the scientists only later, because in many respects. And Professor Carvalho and myself have been one of those pioneers who has tried to introduce sustainability in the energy system. And we, we wrote a book, which is published by uh, Kluwer, uh, pub academic publisher, and it was for us and for most of the people in in the energy field, this was the first approach scientifically to this problem. Now, I would like to, to in uh, writing this book, we try to see what the really is behind this work, and looking to the, to the literature, we discovered that there are many different uh, definitions of that. And I, would, I selected a few of them just to show you how this world, sustainability, has been born. And one of the first is World Commission on Environment and, on environment and Development. It's so-called Branderland Commission. Mrs. Branderland is former as the chairman of the Norwegian government, and she was chairing this commission. And in this document, which has been produced by this uh, commission, 
is a definition which I'm not going to read, you, you can read by yourself, how it is defined by the Underland Commission, which is very, uh, from the very beginning in the United Nations. The second definition is in Agenda 21. Agenda 21 is, is uh, one of those UN resolutions which has been uh, presented in uh, uh, Rio conference. So the Rio conference has this. This definition um, is a more political definition. You see, the, the difference in this definition of the sustainability is just the, uh, what is the accent in that. And this one is really a political definition. Am I? No. Okay. That's where I'm moving back. No. Somebody has to help me how to come back. No, no, no. Too far. Go back. Here. Okay. And this is a the oldest definition of sustainability which we found in the world, it's produced in the 11th century by the, uh, 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 by the brotherhood in Rome. Catholic brotherhood was very old, it's a monastery, and they collected all, for the time, all the information which are available, so that they're, they're, they have been speaking about the development, generally, politic, generally in, a, in a world. And one, one of the definitions they used in, the, in these documents on the Earth chapter, which is very interesting to compare with these two, which I showed before, they are not very different. They are almost the same in in wording. Even in the meaning is even even much much more expressed. And I thought I look for other doc, uh, document which may give us how the word sustainability has been generated. And here is a one which is I found very interesting it is uh, President. Thomas Jefferson on his inauguration speech in 1889, he, you, in his speech, he used this phrase in defining sustainability. So that, okay, sustainability is with us for a long time. And our approach now is technical, academic, uh, political, and different aspects of that. So it seems me it would be good to know that this world is a generator before we even start to think, to think about it. I was going to give you, Maria Grassa and myself have written several books, and I'm just going to show you a cover page of these books, which, are, which we have used to express what the meaning of the sustainability is for the energy field, because we, we have been very much devoted to the energy field. And what I would like, and I will have a special lecture on that. Lately, I have, I have written the, this book, which is related to sustainable resiliency of, uh, of power plants in the system catastrophe. And that's a very important aspect nowadays, because this is not a technical problem, it's not uh, only uh, a scientific problem, it is a social problem, because catastrophe are not the, the and I have a model how, to, how you can predict what the catastrophe can be in any, in any yeah, so this is one of the new buzzy words coming, and that's resilience. Resilience is a 
capacity of the system to, with, to withstand sudden changes in the system. Now I, I'm coming back to the conference itself. Conference is how we started. After we published this book, my colleague, Professor Jerko Bogdan and Professor Kemal Hanyovic invited me to, to, to on, on, the, on our conversation in some of the occasion. And they said, why not to have a conference? And they proposed me that I should take chair of the scientific committee of, the, of this conference. And that's how I've become a leading person in this and contributed substantially on the first, I think, three or four conferences. I thought later on some other people came in and contributed substantially to the development of this idea. And in, in this first uh, people who, are, who came, I invited this group of people to join me in the first conference. And there are, you can see that they are different from different places and they contributed and I want to like to pay tribute to that. that they are very important in the development of this. Now we come to, to the, this history that how many of these conferences is. And I was asking Professor Dewey to help me, and he sent me uh, some table which I used, and you can see here the data of all the conferences we, we had. And you, you can notice, if you carefully look at that, that at the beginning we, we started with a very, very uh, limited number of the people. But in, in this first two or three conferences, we focus only on energy field, and not only energy field, but specifically to the, to the uh, energy as a science, and not as energy as, a, uh, and, as a, uh, something which we have to study more deeply. And in these conferences, you, if you look at that, you can see that some of, the, of this uh, uh, conferences after, I think, 2003, uh, they become larger and larger. And you see now that here, I, I was told that there is about 1,000, uh, about uh, 600 <coughs> people. So that this idea, the conference has been developed in, 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 in certain prospective way, but the main point is that conference has grown up during the, this period. What I would like here uh, to focus your attention, there is a certain sudden jump in, in, a, in the development. The new idea comes in. We, who started this conference, have in mind only energy, and energy as a scientific field. But later on, some people argue, and I think they are as it was shown, the conference has gained by some new approach which is introduced in the, in the organization of the conference. I may even not agree with, the, with this new development, but that does mean, I think, the best way to show that this conference concept is really good is number of people as a team. What I would like here is to say that, to give some credit to people who followed me after the, in, in, this, uh, in this chair uh, of the uh, scientific committee, uh, Professor Noam from the University of Pennsylvania. In, now we have Professor Carvalho who is chairing this scientific committee. Uh, scientific committee uh, with, uh, you know, but what I would like here, which you uh, don't see, it, uh, the idea in, in the development of this conference and its concept 
I have to be to give credit to the Professor Deutsch. He was very active in in developing concept, not only organization. Organization part is a, is a is a technical part, but in the concept, I think he he was one of the leading person who contributed it. How he did it's a very also interesting point for you, for me. Was, uh, uh, okay. I This is a new uh, uh, committee now in action, and this is something I, w I would like to emphasize, the very important part in the development. People from U University of Zagreb and Mechanical <laughs> Engineering Faculty, I used to be professor there some time, many years ago, and uh, they came to the idea that the conference by itself is a very interesting event. And people would like to, to come here, attend. Dubrovnik is especially uh, interesting place to come. But I think they came to the new idea. And this is a new idea, to develop the uh, Institute of Sustainable Development, Energy, and Water Environment. This is a public organization uh, developed by, according to the Croatian law. So this is a now new organization, but new organization which doesn't take only only problem related uh, related to the organization of this conference. But as I was told, there are a number of projects which they are preparing and running trying to develop this idea of sustainable development. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your... Thank you, Professor Afghan, for your kind words. Uh, we are really very thankful to you because you came with the whole idea of uh, this conference. Uh, and as always, you had ideas that came uh, before time, but they proved that their time was coming. And I'm really thankful uh, to you for uh, uh, having founded this conference. Uh, the conference is uh, traditionally organized by University of Zagreb and Instituto Superior Tecnico from uh, Lisbon, since research groups at those two institutions uh, uh, developed uh, the idea of Professor Afghan to start the series of uh, conferences. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Ivan Juraga, the Dean of Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture of University of Zagreb, uh, to give his uh, welcome address. Good morning, uh, dear chairman, distinguished guests, and dear colleagues. It is my great pleasure to greet and welcome you to Zdeves Conference here in Dubrovnik, historic city of Croatia. And you know, Dubrovnik is a jewel of Adriatic coast. The topics that we are going to discuss in a such comprehensive way during next days or during the whole this week are really impressive. Sustainable development in energy, energy policy, water, waste treatment, environment, transportation, and other related areas represent some of the key challenges of the contemporary world number of the present delegates you hear and participants and your professional curriculums
provides the guarantees that outcome of your deliberation will make a significant contribution to the world, very important questions. And uh, now in this part, let me say a few words about University of Zagreb and the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture. University of Zagreb has among 60 and 70,000 students. Now it's almost close to 70,000. 50% of all students from Croatia are at university in Zagreb. We have 29 faculties and three academies. University of Zagreb has more than 160 undergraduate programs, more than 180 graduate programs, and more than 60 doctoral programs. The strategic goal is to be a research-oriented institution with teaching of high quality. So you can see also the, some data about the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering in Zagreb, where there are a lot of professors and young colleagues here, which are involved in the organization of this event. We have today around 200, 2,500 students, more than 400 employees, already graduated 10,000 engineers, and you can see more than 300 PhD. In this uh, moment, we are running with three different study program. We have mechanical engineering study program, naval architecture, aeronautical engineering. What is very important also, let me show that our faculty is founded 1919 and today we, lives, we live a, mo a life of modern academic institution where modern techniques and strategies are connected with, with research. Our laboratories are strong support for education, knowledge building, transfer technology in robotics, material science, production technology, energy, design, shipbuilding, and aeronautical engineering. Now you can see some parts of our lab at the Faculty of Computing and Electrotechnic and also Faculty of Mechanical Engineering. And naval architecture. So these are labs doing and dealing with renewable energy, with smart grids, and with projects with industry, and also research projects. So that's all almost new projects. And uh, what is very important, uh, at the end, let me also remind you that uh, there are some very interesting and good places which deserve to be visited in Croatia and what are very connected with sustainable development. This is one of our national park. This is the other nas uh, national park. Sorry, I have one but something go, it's wrong with my, yeah, this is the other national park, Slapovi Krke. And at the end, uh, finally, I wish you to spend this conference time in a friendly, open, and pleasant atmosphere and enjoy in Dubrovnik and in Croatia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jurega, for your kind words. Uh, 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 I think it's also important to say that uh, uh, our faculty is uh, uh, having part in the sustainable future of uh, Croatia. Uh, there are some 300 uh, megawatt of wind uh, installed in Croatia, and out of those, 60 were built by our professor, uh, 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 Čurković. Uh, 
we are happy to be again in this beautiful historic city of uh, Dubrovnik for the seventh time. It's the eighth conference, but seventh time in Dubrovnik. Uh, uh, the city of Dubrovnik is the capital of uh, Dubrovnik Neretva County, uh, as it used to be the capital of the Dubrovnik Republic, uh, with uh, which it uh, mostly coincides the borders, and uh, which is hiding uh, many more treasures that uh, I hope you will have time to uh, discover in those uh, seven days here. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Nikola uh, Dobroslavic, the prefect of the Dubrovnik Neretva County, to give his welcome address. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I prepared my speech in Croatian, but I will try to say it in English. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here in Dubrovnik, in Dubrovnik Neretva region, on behalf of our region. I thank the organizer, organizers to have chosen Dubrovnik and our region for the venue one another time. I'm quite certain you will have all best conditions for your eighth conference here in Dubrovnik. Mm -hmm. The Republic of Dubrovnik, which was in this area an independent entity and independent state, for almost 500 years, had numerous regulations on sustainable development and the protection of environment. It was regulated, among other documents, in the Statute of Dubrovnik Neretva, the Dubrovnik Republic from 1272. I will only mention that Dubrovnik, ancient Dubrovnik, already in the 13th century had the SU system. SU system. Water supply system was built already in 15th century. And how perfect they were built says the fact that they are in function even today. It is also interesting they had forbid to cut the trees in the city. The branches of the tree could only be cut in front of the commission of three members. Our predecessors successfully solved their problems and we have to meet our challenges today. This county has all the necessary documents for sustainable development, for protection, and for renew renewable energy. But of course, this is our permanent task, and we are devoted to fulfill it. I'm sure, and I wish you the success of this conference here in Dubrovnik. I'm sure that you will contribute to the scientific results which we have in this area. At the end, I wish you a nice stay in Dubrovnik, in our county, and I am looking forward to meet you one another time when you come to visit Dubrovnik. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dobroslavic, for your very kind uh, words, and I would say excellent uh, translation skills <laughs> from uh, Croatian to English. Uh, we have uh, 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 organized uh, last year the first Zdevas conference that was held outside of Dubrovnik 
in uh, Ohrid, Republic of Macedonia, and it was huge success thanks to organizer uh, chair there, uh, Professor Natasha Markovska. Due to huge interest in our conference, uh, we have decided to organize every even year a conference in new destination, while still coming back to Dubrovnik in every odd year. Uh, the next year destination will be announced at the closing session to keep you uh, <laughs> awake. <laughs> um, hopefully uh, you bear with us until uh, then. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Teodora Bradovic Goncharovska, State Councillor for Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning of the Republic of Macedonia, uh, to give her welcome address. The floor is yours. Good morning. Um, dear participants of the eighth conference on sustainable development on energy, water, and environmental systems. Let me start with the appreciation for the opportunity to address you on this conference with many highly important and interesting topics. Indeed, environment and natural resource protection plays an increasingly important role with respect to smart and inclusive growth. Eco-innovations will thus become a key driver of competitiveness and employment. Nevertheless, a comprehensive strategy for ecological modernization requires contribution from a range of different policy areas, including environmental policy, but also policy areas like energy, trade, industry, research, transport, and budget, as well as inclusion from different actors and different levels. It will only be possible to meet the economic and environmental challenges that lie ahead with a comprehensive approach. Economic stability and fiscal sustainability, for instance, cannot be achieved without major advertisement in energy and resource efficiency. Acceleration of the uptake of environmental technologies in all industries to, is needed in this context. Creating green lead markets requires long-term and ambitious policies as well as technological leadership. Research and development policies, industrial policies, and environmental policies have to be coherent in promoting such markets. The Republic of Macedonia as a candidate country for full membership into the European Union stands in front of the challenges of efficient implementation of serious reforms in its society, where the area of energy has particular importance for its overall development. Clean energy and climate change together are top key priorities in the European agenda for achieving sustainability as well as for, for my country under the National Strategy for Sustainable Development. The rationale behind this strong relation lays in the fact that all sustainable energy projects, interventions, practices result in corresponding reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Let me conclude by stressing the fact that ambitious environmental policy is a key driver of economic growth and challenge and opportunity for sustainable development. Good governance in energy, environmental and water sectors is also one of the key factors and driving force for achieving better lifestyle. This requires all levels of government to support and to cooperate with each other, taking into account the different institutional settings, cultures and specific circumstances in different regions. We, the representatives from developing countries, faced with the challenge to adapt ourselves to our demanding environmental EU standards, see this conference as a platform for helping us in wise policy making, especially when it addresses our future obligations under climate acquis. Therefore, I would like to take liberty to propose organization of parallel ministerial meeting or meetings during the conference where issues of common interest can be debated. I see this conference as an arena to strengthen partnership, especially between science and policy makers. I have no doubt that this conference will be again more than successful. I thank you.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Teodora Bradovic Goncharovska, for your uh, very kind words. Dubrovnik can uh, thank its long term reaches to the excellent trade relations with its hinterland. The trading route starting from Dubrovnik went through Bosnia and Herzegovina, reaching Silk Road and going all the way to China. Wishing to help regional research connections, I would like to invite Mr. Reuf Hajibegic, Assistant Minister at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Trade and Economic Relations, Bosnia and Herzegovina, to give his uh, welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, appreciated participants of conference. First of all, I would like to greet you in front of the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Economic Relations of Bosnia-Herzegovina. My name is Reuf Hajibegic and I am Assistant Minister responsible for sector of natural resources, energy and environmental protect protection. It is my special honor to be one of the participants of this very important international conference, which is in one place successfully gathered such a, a, a huge number of eminent experts from many countries for the re, uh, researching matters related with the sustainable development of energy, water, and environmental protection systems. Sustainable development is in this moment in the world one of the most important topic themes, and it is a theme for conversation between international high officials and participants of many international conferences uh, in the world. Sustainable development connects in one matters of energy, water, and environmental protection, and directly create development of a green economy improve social segment of life and reduction of poverty in the world. Due to the sustainable development is very important for all of the people in the world. As a representative of Bosnia and Herzegovina, I participated on UN conference about sustainable, sustainable development, Rio plus 20, which result are documents called Zero Draft Rio Declaration, Rio De Declaration. The future, we want, we want Johannes Johannesburg uh, uh, declarations and many others. They connecting in one matters related with sustainable development. The most important global goals in that manner are sustainable economy and strengthening all inter, uh, institutional frames frames for sustainable development. Activities and priorities which are needed to do in future in improving sustainable development are energy, water, environmental protection, security of food, security of oceans and sea, uh, economical social inclusions, education, sustainable production and consumption, Science and, uh, science and technology, trade, and many others. Most important of these are energy, water, and environmental protection, and, very, uh, and they are themes of the conference. Energy in which are included supporting of using renewable sources of energy and sustainable energy, energy efficiency, supporting of using modern sources of energy, improving improving the transfer system and security of supplying of electric uh, energy. Water in which are included carefully using hydro potential of rivers, carefully using and exploitation recourses from oceans and seas, protection of water in coastal areas and protecting uh, water resources in plant earth with special importance of supplying with drinking water for all the people in the world. 
environmental protection, in which are included activities on prevention of climate changes, natural, natural catastrophes, pre, uh, protection and sustainable using of forest, biodiversity and ground throwing, uh, through, throwing out from using dangerous substances and chemicals, sustainable management of hard and solid waste. In shortly, I mentioned themes of this conference, which eminent experts will discuss and elaborate one by one in details in the exposures and the pan panel discussions. I would like also to emphasize interest of my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, for participation in this conference, <coughs> having in mind the rich natural resources for sustainable development in goal of their economy development in the future. On the end of my speech, I would like to express my best wishes for successful work for all participants of this conference and for high results of uh, this conference on matters of energy, water, and environmental protection for sustainable development of all our planet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Reuf Hajibegic, for your very kind words. One of uh, pivotal partners of this Davos conference is the World Academy of Art and Science. I would like to invite the president of the Academy, Professor Ivo Schlaus, to give an introductory talk, Contemporary World and the Role of the World Academy of Art and Science. Excellencies, distinguished participants, <coughs> dear friends, it is an honor to address this meeting and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me. The title of my talk is Contemporary World and the Role of the World Academy. So, the contemporary world, maybe oddly, is best described by the opening sentence of Dickens' novel, The Tale of Two City, where, where he writes, this is the best of time, this is the worst of time. And he describes, of course, the time of the French Revolution. Okay? What we are undergoing now is much more profound than any of the revolutions that we ever had. It's definitely about of the same magnitude as the great agricultural revolution when we moved from the hunter-gatherers to the agricultural society, but this is definitely much more pronounced. Along the line of the best, of course, there is a number of things that you see from the increase in the GDP per capita to the increase in the life expectancy, and most important, the human capital has actually self-augmented. It has shown the bootstrapping effect, the famous Minhausen story that you actually take yourself up and increase. On the other hand, it is the time, as we all know, of an enormous number of crises, several of them, the one very Notable now is the financial economic crisis. Obviously, we do need new economic thinking. In a way, we should be going back to Adam Smith, who at that time when he was doing this thing, there was no economy. He was a moral philosopher, and we are very far from any, no, any moral in the economy of today. He already was emphasizing the issue of inequality, and we will come to this uh, in a minute. What people believe is shown, for instance, in a recent April uh, poll of Ipsos Publicists, and actually throughout many European countries, the comment is, it's going to be worse, uh, the things are not good. And of course, then we come to our sacred cows, and there is a number of sacred cows, one of them is a market, and of course, market is far from being satisfactory in many, in many ways. On one side, of course, market is more than democracy. On the other side, and therefore has, of course, no tyranny of the majority, as uh, uh, Madison and Monroe emphasized, and there is no 
uh, tyranny of the minority either, but of course, as George Soros wrote, there is an irrationality of the crowd. And of course, what we witness now is the fact that the real economy is really much, much smaller than the virtual economy. Of course, we very often, in the title of this conference, is energy, so is energy the solution? Of course, energy is extremely powerful things, and there are correlations between GDP per capita and energy consumption, as long as the energy consumption is below three tons of oil equivalent per capita per year. But if all of the people on the earth would be consuming that amount of energy, we will already now be consuming almost three times more energy than what we are consuming now. And of course, when this population of our Earth increases from 7 billion to 9 billion, which we expect in about 50 years, the situation will be much, much worse. Of course, the answer uh, put forward by Stephen Hawking is we have to colonize our immediate surroundings. We are already, as any of the mobile phone shows, we are already in outside, outside of our Earth, but colonizing would be much more difficult and in no way simple. If we would like to have uh, all of the citizens of the world having the standard, even of this country of Croatia, which is not particularly high, we would need more than two Earths. If we would like to have the standards of Western European countries, it would require as many as four Earths, and we simply do not have that many. What we, have this, what we have done so far is shown in the article published two years ago in, the, in Nature by Rickstrom and several others, pointing out actually that not only in the case of the climate change, which is the one that you see there pointing up, but much more seriously in the case of the biodiversity, in the case of the nitrogen cycle, we have considerably went over the boundaries that we can tolerate. Now, if we look at the various threats, uh, typically one lists these threats, but rather than listing them, let me show you the graph which I showed some uh, about 10 years ago, first time on the occasion of the celebration of the birthday of one of the distinguished fellow of the World Academy, uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, Joe Rothblatt, where I have plotted the dangers as in a two-dimensional space of probability and consequences. And of course, there are things which are extremely pro probable, which indeed have a 100% probability, and uh, there is economic crisis which we have, the demographic issue, and so on. And there are things which are, of course, uh, luckily very improbable, and if they would occur, like for instance in this entire sausage of the natural phenomena, a very rare earthquake or the rare encounter of a major celestial body hitting us, of course that would lead to the destruction of the civilizations. Uh, about uh, 20 years ago, before the end of the Cold War, uh, the situation in the world was characterized by what is the insignia on the bulletin of the atomic scientists, where there is a clock showing how far we are from total disaster. And at that time, the clock was at five minutes before midnight. When it started, when they decided to put it back in the, in the 50s, it was seven minutes before midnight. Then it deteriorated, and of course, deterioration made this uh, strange acronym MAD, which of course is pronounced MED, and MED it is, is mutually assured destruction. Now that is a situation that of course we cannot tolerate, and of course after the second, after the Cold War, uh, there was a very good feeling that it would go to better, at least we still had the weapons of mass destruction, but most of them were intended to be put from the trigger alert status to a more dormant status. And that brought us to this uh, other red uh, circle called weapons of mass destruction. At that time, we were at about 15 minutes to midnight. And then the things deteriorated with this terrorism, with enormous economic difficulties, and so on. So now we are once again at five minutes to midnight, an extremely dangerous uh, situation. Now, when we look at all of the various indicators in the last uh, several hundred years, so let's say here from 1750 and so on, what we see is an enormous change. 
And whoever would say that we are in any sort of the stationary situation or that we are converging towards something immediately sees that this is by no means uh, true. So the contemporary world is a world that is global, rapidly changing. All of that is generated by science. We may say, aha, uh -huh, science is a bad guy. Why do we do it? Of course, if there would be no change, we would still be the amoebas. So we don't want that. We want to change. And as much changing as possible is our name of the game. And we human beings change as well. Of course, it is just said very clearly 2,000 years ago by Aristotle, all men by their nature have a desire to know. And since many of us are related to education in one way or another, there is an important thing to remember that the old Chinese proverb said that spoiling the youth uh, has been considered one of the three most deplorable, sin most deplorable sins. Uh, and indeed, education is uh, an essential thing. In a global world, of course, as never before, the future of each one of us depends on the good of all. This was a statement of the Nobel laureates uh, on the occasion of the 100 years anniversary of the first Nobel Prize. And of course, what it shows is it shows that in a famous golden rule, which says, do to others what you would like others to do to you, your neighbor is indeed every person living on the earth. Adam Smith was already classifying several different capitals, and we can sort of amass them in three groups. The natural capital, the human capital, and the human-made capital, material and social. We nowadays have a tendency of emphasizing the human-made capital, particularly money. Money, of course, is nothing else but the invention of human being, invention which we have for barely roughly 3,000 years, so a small uh, thing in our overall history. The real wealth of nation, I'm and emphasizing the same title that Adam Smith put for his famous book published in 1776, The Wealth of Nation. The Real Wealth of Nation, as written by the Human Development Report, are people. And the basic aim is really to enlarge the human freedom and choices that people have. And this is now the question, how do we measure that? One, me one way to measure that, which goes from basically the 30s, introduced by Kuznets, was the gross domestic product or gross, gross domestic product per capita. And of course, we all knew from the very beginning, Kuznets, when he was defending this uh, in front of an American Congress, said this is an inadequate measure. And uh, Bobby Kennedy, essentially in his last campaign, was saying that GDP is a wrong measure. So what can we actually do better? We can use the so-called Human Development Index that has been developed by Amartya Sen and uh, Mahbub Al Khan. And uh, here are some recent data which you see that, for instance, uh, you compare Human Development Index and the GDP, and you see that in case of Germany, this would be Ten, uh, for 10 places, Germany would be worse, Austria would be for five better, Croatia would be four, and so on. But then there is another important thing. They already in this year indicated the importance, or rather the very negative effect that the inequality has. And for instance, in my country, where the inequality, for instance, can be measured with the famous Gini index, uh, the Human Development Index decreases by 15% due to inequality. Large inequality causes more crime, more corruption, more slowing down in the development, lower competitiveness, and the worst thing, it causes the lower life expectancy. So in principle, we should be trying to have much less inequality than we have today. Far that anybody argues for the total equality, indeed that would not be a good thing. Plato argued for the ratio of five to one. J.P. Morgan, a famous banker at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, argued for 21. What we have now is of the order of 1,000 to one, and that is obviously not an appropriate thing. 
uh, in an article of the last year in The Economist, the summary of the so-called inclusive wealth report by uh, Sir uh, Parta Dasgupta and his collaborators came actually the assessment of the human versus all the other capital. And for instance, in the case of the United States, we know that the total wealth of the total GDP per year is of the order of uh, about 20 trillion US dollars. When you look at the entire, you come to 117. So the human capital in the case of United States represents 75%. In the case of the UK, even 88%. Even countries that are extremely rich in natural, uh, in natural capital, like Russia, like Saudi Arabia, still have a sizable amount of the uh, human capital. Now, this uh, uh, slide, which I have already shown, of course, shows that we are now at the moment where, obviously, we need a paradigm change, okay? So now, what do we mean by a paradigm change? It's easy, actually, to look into something which, of course, is my narrow field of expertise, physics, because physics has undergone, as you all know, two major paradigm changes. One is called typically the Copernican Revolution, and the other is the revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, the so-called theory of relativity and quantum physics. Now, let us look physics compared with society, economy, and politics. Physics, of course, is an extremely simple thing, as can be proven by the fact uh, that laws of physics have not changed, as far as we know, for the last 13.7 billion years. Neither, of course, have the ingredients. All electrons still are the same electrons, and they do not change. And then there were sacred cows, like time, like space, like determinism. Okay, how about the political, social, and economic sphere? Of course, people and society do change dramatically all the time. Even biologically, human beings have changed in the last 10,000 years. Now, the sacred cows are market, private properties, and of course, they should be looked in comparison with the time and space and determinism. And then, of course, in the case of uh, political, social, and economy, we have the phenomenon of so-called black swans, as written by Taleb, in physics, of course, we have something which is very deep, but which we luckily understand. And these are Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg uncertainty principle tell us that actually deep there in nature, it is uncertainty that is the essential governing rule. In spite of these uncertainties, we are capable, based on quantum electrodynamics, for instance, to make predictions with the accuracy of one in a billion. Now let us see what the human people conceive about various professions. And here is the long study uh, done by the National Science Foundation, and you see that at the top of the list are medical profession and scientific profession. Scientific profession are those at the second one. And now more and more people basically trust science. They much less trans trust anybody else. In terms of science, there are three pillars that I would like to emphasize, the academies, the research institute, and the universities. Our tradition with universities, of course, is very old. We can look at the 19th century as being, again, the recreation of the universities through the work of uh, Humboldt. And uh, what I want to point out is the sentence written by the Fellow of the World Academy and also President of the Academia Europea, Stig Strimherb, where he wrote, university has a mission and a responsibility which goes far beyond the task of providing industry with efficient employees, marketable ideas, or science-based solution. The mission is the production of mature, independent, critical, responsible personalities who are not tools in a service of church, state, party, business, or anybody else. It is this creation which is the total aim of any educational system, particularly of 
the higher education that leads us into the life in a way. Academy, of course, goes, uh, it has a history from the time of uh, Plato, and there one should remember that ever from the time of Plato and on, there is a special relation between these two activities which permeates everything. On one is in science and the other is politics. There is no way actually to be free of them. There is a history from Takshahila, Kanchipuram, the Renaissance Academy, the Academia dei Lincei, uh, the famous Leopoldina, then the French Academy, the Brandenburg Academy, and let me just go to the World Academy, the one that I happen now to represent, and there are several fellows of the World Academy here. It has been founded in 1960 after actually several of the illustrious people like Albert Einstein, who initiated, did not see its actual first uh, meeting. As you see, Einstein, Fleming, Schanz, and so on were the founding fathers. And when it was, when it was founded, actually had 40 founding members. Now there are something like 650 of us from 80, 60 countries. As you see, when it was founded, there was quite an illustrious group of Nobel laureates like Pierre Auger, like Boyd, like uh, Miller, like Uri, Russell, uh, Myrdal, Noel Baker, and so on. And they were from different countries, but primarily it was, as I refer to them, the so-called victor countries of the Second World War. There were 14 from the USA, six from France, six from Netherlands, five from the UK, and you see nobody from Germany, nobody from Russia, nobody from China, and so on. So yes, there was quite, uh, quite uh, a lack of fully representing the situation. What is the objective of the World Academy? Is to contribute to the progress of global civilization human welfare, evolution of global governance, peace, sustainable development, and realization of human dignity through transnational studies, projects, appraisals, and recommendations. Academy, during this period of somewhat more than 50 years, had 12 presidents, majority of them from the United States. And besides, of course, the World Academy, the only one that is world, there is a number of academies that are on the level of con the continents or about continents. The largest one is the so-called Third World Academy, the Academy of Sciences of the Developing World, established in 83 by our fellow, the World Academy fellow, Abdul Salam, Nobel laureate. There is an African Academy, Islamic World Academy, Latin, uh, uh, American Academy, then oddly there are three European academies, and then there are association of European academies, and there are association of all world academy, the so-called inter-academy panel. There are various tasks of various academies, somewhat different from the national and international, and let me now concentrate on the current activity of the world academy. As I have shown in the previous slides, the one that you have several fast changing curves, uh, we do believe that we are now at the time of the paradigmatic change. And as I said in the first sentence, this paradigmatic change is as profound as uh, the time of uh, the agricultural revolution and much more dangerous. So it is now the time really to think very carefully and prepare for this change. The human capital, together with the natural capital, obviously plays a paramount, uh, a paramount uh, role. It is often said that while natural laws are independent of us, our law, human law, the rule of law and so on, is something that human beings make. And so in a way it almost sounds that we can make them as we want. Not quite. Because after all, when you look at the system situation, you have not a small number, you have seven billions. What will happen with these seven billions? It will increase to nine billion within about 100 years. Then what will be next? In another 100 years, it will go down to two billion. And demography is an unfortunately very robust beast. There is nothing you can do to change that because unfortunately, or fortunately for us, it depends on a small part of the total world population. I am useless, 
ladies are useful, and even they are not fully useful, they are useful for the terms of, of uh, demography in a narrow interval of their lifespan that now goes to 100 years, so it is about one third of their lifespan that they can actually uh, devote to this of having more people, and what we have now is we have the famous fertility index dropping more and more. So it is really very robust and we have to think very carefully. So the world that we have is a world of 7 billion going rather quickly to 9 billion and again dropping quickly to 2 billion. And we are not only without boundary condition, we are bound to Earth. Earth keeps us in a certain surrounding, so we have to be very careful that we satisfy that. Notwithstanding the idea of colonizing the space and so on, for a long time this will be our own, only home, and we better take care of that. Human beings on top of that are rational, but also irrational beings. This is very important. We think by our brain and by our heart, and that is our characteristics. We are creative, and education has a very special role. role. Security of course, is part of this, and these things all interchange. And security, both including military, water, energy, sustainability, and so on, which are the subject of the conference, yes, they are extremely important, and they should be considered, and World Academy considers the human security to be one of the major efforts, including, of course, the new economic thinking, as George Soros likes to call it. We do need a new economic thinking, but we do need new thinking throughout. So this is really the time which is the best and the worst. Let us make it the best and the most exciting time of all. And I'm sure that you, the new generation coming, will be, of course, uh, the carrier of all of these changes in a very positive world to achieve the goals that humanity always have, prosperity and the well-being for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva, for uh, very inspirational words. I always had a hunch, and after your uh, lecture, I'm sure that uh, uh, it is so, that sustainable use of uh, uh, resources uh, and more equitable use of resources is something that is uh, uh, crucial for security also. Uh, I would like to invite now uh, 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 Professora Maria Graça Carvalho, member of the European Parliament, to give her introductory talk on Horizon 2020 and the future of European research. Because sustainable development needs huge uh, support of research and research needs to be funded. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister, State Council of Dubrovnik, uh, um, mayor, uh, Dean of the University of uh, Mechanical Engineer of the University of Zagreb, distinguished guests, Professor Nevin Dwich, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin by saying that it is a great honor to have been invited to give this uh, introductory address to the eighth Conference on Sustainable Development of Energy, Water and uh, Environment Systems. Uh, this is a conference that I have uh, attended, uh, I think, uh, since the beginning. I, I missed uh, last year in Macedonia, and I apologize for that because I want to visit uh, uh, Macedonia. Um, and uh, I, I should express my admiration for the achievement that uh, Professor Nevin Witch, that's the main organizer, the local organizer, in having uh, managed to establish this conference on such a sound footing. You have seen the numbers all increasing along the years. Uh, and I'm aware that all uh, of the hard work that he has devoted to ensuring that uh, conference uh, to be a, a success and will continue to be a success. 
Professor Nevan Dwich has worked with me in the past in Lisbon, in the Technical University of Lisbon, and now is merged with the, the classical university, and we only have a big university uh, that is called the University of Lisbon. Um, and uh, the scale and the scope of this conference with researchers attending from across Southeast Europe, all over Europe and outside Europe uh, is a sign of the impact that his work is uh, in, in general um, in Croatia uh, uh, of furthering science and innovation. Uh, it is also a particular source of gratification for me that this is the first time that the conference has been held with Croatia as a full member of the European Union. Uh, and uh, myself, being associated with this part of the world uh, since the 80s, I used to come here to Dubrovnik uh, to attend the meetings in the International Center of Heat and Mass Transfer that was located here. I was here in 84, 85, 82. Uh, many meetings um, were very, very successful international center uh, on the field of heat and mass transfer. Uh, I, also, I also had the opportunity to visit uh, um, Sarajevo and the mechanical engineer department, uh, to visit um, uh, the former Yugoslavia in, in Serbia, um, many research centers, uh, and stay for, for a while in this part uh, of um, Southeast Europe. And I had the privilege to, to have uh, collaborating with me in Lisbon many uh, top uh, class scientists from uh, from here, for, from Southeast Asia, from Professor Naim Afghan that also stayed with us, uh, Professor Nevan Dwish, as I, am, uh, I have said, and I had also a very close collaboration with Professor Anjalik Kemu and uh, Ian Halic. Uh, so I'm particularly happy that uh, the fact that Croatia is now a full member of the EU and that the other countries are doing their own way uh, and that I hope that uh, very soon all the neighbor countries of this region will be full members uh, of the EU and will, for the scientific community, uh, community this will be very important uh, so that we can even collaborate uh, in an easier way uh, and be part of all this uh, European research area that is so important and that facilitates the mobility and, and the funding for the researchers and for the companies and the, uh, with special for SMEs. So good luck for all the region uh, and uh, I wish you a successful future um, for Croatia that has just entered and for all the others that will enter. Hope that they will enter soon and we will also help Europe to, to start growing again and uh, to get out of the crisis. So, after these introductory remarks, I would like to, to talk, uh, uh, my introductory speech will be in two parts. First, I will devote to the general policy, uh, research and innovation policy in Europe, and the second part to uh, the main uh, program of funding research and innovation in Europe, that is Horizon 2020. So let me begin with the general nature of the European policy. <clears throat> As probably you know, research and innovation uh, is probably the first priority of uh, uh, Europe 2020. The Europe 2020 strategy is the overall uh, policy uh, for European Union. Uh, the, it focuses in five uh, areas employment, innovation, education, poverty reduction, and climate and energy. And um, research, innovation, and education is probably the first priority in the European Union. As you probably, prob some of you know, uh, we are deciding now, we, had, uh, we have finished the negotiations for the next European budget for the period of 
2014-2020, and the only two, for the first time, unfortunately, we have a budget that is lower than the previous budget. We have 10% uh, less in the European budget that we had um, uh, in the period 2007-2013. Uh, and we have more members like Croatia, but uh, the only policies that increase the funding are exactly education, research, and innovation. All the other areas have a decrease uh, to compensate the overall decrease of the EU budget and to compensate the increase of um, research, innovation, and education. The, the one that has increased more is education, but it's a small budget because education is mainly um, uh, a member state responsibility, but had an increase of around 60%, and research and innovation uh, altogether had an increase of 30%. Um, so, uh, more specific, specifically on the, um, one of the pillars that supports the European policy is the Innovation Union. Uh, this Innovation Union is necessary because in Europe we must do more to ensure that we transform our research activities into concrete results. This entails generation uh, new and better services and products if we uh, want to remain competitive in the global marketplace and to improve the quality of life in Europe. I would even go so far to say that we are currently facing something of an innovation emergency. Although the, EU, the European Union market is the largest in the world, it remains fragmented and is, is still not innovation friendly. We still have problems in passing uh, results from research to the market. We are very good and we are number one in the world, for example, in scientific publications, but in indicators like patents and uh, commercialization of uh, what we developed in research, we lag behind other parts of the world. It happens many times that ideas that are developed in research centers or in universities in Europe w will be exploit and produce somewhere else in the world, even when the market is again in Europe. So we are producing knowledge uh, to, to create jobs somewhere else in the world, and even when the market is in Europe. So we need to change this situation and, um, for the, and to make sure that we also are able to exploit and to produce to make uh, re to give commercial value to the what is produced in our research centers, and for that we need to fund uh, continue to fund research to fund the whole cycle of innovation. So the, the pilot scales, industrial demonstration, early enters to the market. But we need to do more than that. We need to remove the barriers, the framework barriers the, to innovation. And this is less bureaucracy, to have a, a more friendly IPR policy, a patent. We are trying to have a, a, a community patent, the European patent. Uh, you know that until now, uh, we have been negotiating, but for 30 years it was impossible to arrive to an agreement to have a European patent. Now we manage. Uh, two countries didn't uh, join because of language issues, Italy and Spain, but all the other uh, countries have joined uh, to have an European patent. Because until now you need to translate to have an European patent, you would have to have patents in all the countries to translate in all the 23 languages. And now we will have uh, European patents still in three languages. Uh, in my opinion, we should have chosen only English, but we will have in German, French, and um, English. Uh, but at least will be better than 23 and will be cheaper than uh, before. So, but we, we need to do more on IPR, 
or less bureaucracy, to have a um, fiscal uh, system that is friendly of, of investment, of SMEs, of innovation. So there is, apart from funding, there is a, many other sectors that Europe has to work uh, in order to, to be able uh, to do the transfer of knowledge to the economy in a smooth uh, way. Uh, so this uh, uh, innovation union that is part of all these policies, research, but also all the cycle until the innovation is crucial for uh, the European future. Within the innovation union, there are also other two elements that are very important, apart from all these framework conditions from innovation. Uh, one is the building of the European research area, and the second is the funding of research and innovation that is the next framework program, Horizon 2020. So first I will concentrate a little bit on the European research area, uh, in particular with reference to the advantage that we can gain from increased mobility and cooperation. Indeed, uh, given its stress on open innovation and on collaboration in the field of science, the European research area is seen as the fifth freedom. In addition to the free circulation, you know that European principles are circulation of people, circulations of capital, of goods, and of services. Now we have added circulation uh, of uh, science, of the scientists, and we consider this the fifth freedom. Concerns the free circulation of researchers and scientific knowledge, including via digital uh, means. So, the main priority of the European research area is first, a more effective national research system, but opti optimal transnational cooperation and competition, uh, open labor market for researchers, so we want to make sure that when you open a, a, a position in one of the member states for a researcher that is, will be open to the all European uh, members, that you can uh, be mobile, that you can, for example, transport your uh, reform, uh, your uh, retirement uh, with you. If you are a researcher, if you work in Lisbon or in Zagreb or in Berlin, and that is very important that we really have uh, only one European community for researchers. Um, another point that we want to, to encourage is the gender equality and gender mainstreaming research. Uh, there are countries that are doing best, uh, better than others, but we still have a lower percentage in average of female researchers in Europe. And uh, there is a big potential uh, there. We, we need to encourage more uh, young girls to go to science and engineering because there is uh, big potential, uh, so we, otherwise we are neglecting 50% uh, of the population. Uh, so, these are the main uh, policies uh, for the European uh, uh, research and innovation area. And I turn now to the second topic of my talk, that is uh, the, the funding. You know that we are organized, as I explained, in seven-year seven periods budget. Uh, so the next one, 2014-2020, and the next framework program that will be the eighth framework program. For the first time, it has a name. Uh, the previous one didn't have a name. It was the sixth framework program, the seventh framework program. And now it's called Horizon 2020. It was a decision of the European Commission uh, to show that this framework program is different in nature and really is, is different, is more ambitious. Uh, it covers the whole cycle of innovation from fundamental research to applied to demonstration, pilot scales, early enters in the markets. It includes uh, not only the framework program but the previous CIP that was a, a program for uh, competitiveness and innovation framework. The previous Intelligent Energy for Europe, 
that was separate from the framework program, and the previous European Institute of Innovation and Technology, the EIT. So all this is now in embedded in the Horizon 2020. So the general objective is to build a society and a world-leading economy based on knowledge and innovation across all the member states. Uh, is, is very ambitious because it covers the whole cycle of innovation, and because of that it needs more fundings, because the last stage, uh, like the pilot scales and the industrial demonstration, are very expensive. Think about energy, demonstrations, large-scale demonstration on renewables, on carbon capture and storage, are very expensive projects. So it's very important that we have um, these uh, um, uh, increased funds for Horizon 2020. So, it's divided in three main pillars, excellence in science, industrial leadership, and societal challenge. On the excellence in science, you have the European Research Council, the Marie Curie, the research infrastructures, the future emerging technologies. You don't have a set of uh, priorities, is only the, the excellence of the idea that counts. And in the Parliament, we have included something new that is, in my opinion, very important. We have included a new chapter, the horizontal chapter, the, with a budget, identified budget, that is called widening participation and promoting excellence. We, if you look at the results of the seven framework program, they are, they are not balanced in terms of geographical distribution. You have a concentrate in some member states, and for example, what we call the new member states have very low participation in the framework program. And doesn't mean that we don't have excellent researchers in these member states. On the contrary, we, have, we know that there are very good uh, excellent research going on in Poland, in Hungary, in Croatia, uh, uh, all over Europe. So, uh, we have developed a concept uh, of stairway to excellence that we continue to have as the sole criteria excellence, but we are saying that we need to finance through Horizon 2020 also smaller units of embryonic excellence not only the top international recognized uh, centers uh, that are most of the times located uh, around Brussels from UK, uh, Holland, Denmark, that are mainly the, the main be beneficiaries of the framework program. And, but this is not only for the new member states, it's also for uh, all, all the countries, because UK, Germany have very imbalanced distribution. In UK, you have a big participation, but it's around uh, London, Cambridge, Oxford. So if you, have, if you go to Scotland, Wales, North, you have a less um, um, balanced participation. So how this, in concrete terms, how is this uh, uh, translate in Horizon 2020? We have... Uh, uh, a scheme that is the teaming, teaming of excellence research, when uh, institutions that have a, a lower participation in framework program uh, will uh, do a, um, a cooperation with institutions that have a higher participation. They need to be both excellence. Uh, and they apply for fundings in Horizon 2020 to collaborate and to do mobility and to do a common agenda, a research agenda. Secondly, the twinning scheme is twinning of research institutions in order to significantly strength in a given field of research an emerging institution of excellence quality uh, with a more established uh, institution. So it's a bit different if, for example, if uh, an institution, a big institution in Germany, wants to create uh, inside an university uh, in a, c a country or an university that participates less in the framework program, he wants to create a new center of research within that university. And 
something that we had in the past, but we enlarged, that is the air chairs. So it, this is also helps the institutions that participate less in framework programs to start participate more if they have a chair with a professor that will help uh, uh, the whole uh, department to be more active in terms of framework program. Uh, another point that is new and was also introduced by the, the European Parliament is the link between the synergies between the Horizon 2020 and the structural funds, the regional funds. We, we are uh, from the European institutions asking the member states to devote more of their regional funds to research, innovation and higher education. And we are saying that they can combine and align the funding with Horizon 2020. First, creating the capacity with scholarships, with, uh, um, with equipment, creating clusters in the areas that are priorities in Horizon 2020. After, they can co-finance the big projects, for example, the industrial demonstration projects. And finally, they can help to commercialize, to fund, to finance startups and uh, SMEs to commercialize results from the Horizon 2020. So it's very important that the two uh, funds uh, work uh, for the same objective, that is the competitiveness of our SMEs, of our industry, and to create capacity in research and innovation all over Europe. The third, the second pillar is the industrial leadership, and there we have a part of key enabling technologies where we have the biotechnology, the nanotechnology, materials, ICT, um, manufacturing industry, and space. And we have a special uh, sub-program for SMEs, for e e innovative SMEs. Uh, the last uh, uh, pillar is called the societal challenge, is where the policy making, makers are asking the researchers to contribute with solutions to solve um, the problems or the big challenge that Europe has to face. There are seven societal challenges. Uh, I'm not going to enumerate all, but there are two societal challenges that are very important to, the, to this conference. One of them is the energy societal challenge, and I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, in the Parliament we have increased the budget of uh, the energy, was our first priority in the Parliament, so we had to decrease a little bit in other uh, areas to increase the energy societal challenge. And we have increased the scope compared with the proposal of the Commission. So we now have a, a complete package of all the technologies, uh, uh, excluding nuclear, because the nuclear has a separate program. Uh, so all the non-nuclear technologies from uh, the renewables, all the renewables, the biofuels, alternative fuels, the hydrogen. The, we give more emphasis to the energy efficiency, so the energy efficiency in all the sectors, sustainable cities, storage, we put a, a large chapter on storage, um, smart grids, microgeneration, that was not in the initial proposal, we have microgeneration, and we have also uh, um, clean, uh, use of fossil fuels, meaning the CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage, and carbon, carbon capture and utilization. However, we have uh, done um, here marking of 85% for renewables and energy efficiency, 70% for research and demonstration, and 15% for the mar market uptaking that is the intelligent energy for Europe that now is included in Horizon 2020. So the, this means that the intelligent energy for Europe will have an increase because it's 15% of the budget for energy that will be more or less 1 billion euro compared with the 700 million that uh, it has now. Uh, so 
there will be uh, important uh, um, uh, work uh, to be done on energy, so it's a very complete uh, uh, package of uh, um, technologies and non-technology issues related to energy and covering the whole scope of non-nuclear energy that I draw your attention. The second uh, uh, societal challenge is related with environment and water. Uh, is included on the societal challenge that is entitled Climate Action, Environment, Resource Efficient and Raw Materials. And uh, we have there the mitigation and adaptation to climate change, uh, protecting the environment, uh, sustainably managing of natural resources, water, biodiversity and ecosystems, ensuring the sustainable supply of non-energy and non-agriculture raw materials, enabling the transition towards a green economy and society through eco-innovation, developing comprehensive and sustainable global environment observation and information systems. I want also to, uh, to conclude to draw your attention for the international cooperation. I know that there are many uh, people from many attendees from outside Europe. This is the most open framework program. So all the country, researchers from all the countries that have relations, diplomatic relations with the EU can participate in the project. It needs to make sense to, um, uh, to have an objective, but they can participate. If they are from developing countries, is paid by the framework program, is paid by the EU. If they are from emerging countries or industrialized countries, there are agreements between the EU and the governments, that ex science and technology agreements that establish who pays what. But you can participate uh, in all the projects. And on top of that, there will be target calls uh, with target parts of the world that already exists, but there will be more, and I give you two examples. Um, there is a list of examples uh, in the proposal of Horizon 2020, in the regulation, but does mean that they will keep only to that examples. It can be more target calls. There will be, a, uh, with Brazil, in the new generation of biofuels, with the, the African sub-Saharan countries, on energy for poverty alleviation, that is something very important. And um, another topic that I want to, to draw your attention, that I think uh, to finish with the good news, is that this, progress is much, this program is much simpler than the previous framework program. I, I did my first report in the parliament was called the re simplification. And I identified uh, 67 measures where the seven framework program could be simplified. And now they are all introduced in Horizon 2020. I hope that uh, in the, during the execution, the commission doesn't start to complicate the program again. But you only have one set of rules. You have a much simpler uh, reimbursement of the costs is 100% of the direct costs, 25% uh, of overheads, and recovery of the VAT for the countries, for the institutions that cannot recover the VAT otherwise. So we have abolished the, um, the time uh, recording for the people that are working 100% in European projects. So there are many simplifications that I hope that will make uh, uh, Horizon 2020 more act uh, attractive uh, to newcomers, uh, to smaller institutions, and to that we don't have only the same people apply uh, to, to these programs. So this uh, brings me to the end of what I have to say uh, today, and uh, I want to draw your attention that there will be a, 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 um, a session during this conference on Horizon 2020, and there will be, I think, a boot uh, of Horizon 2020 throughout the conference. Uh, and 
uh, I, um, I would like to, uh, in concrete, uh, to hope that uh, concrete results for the European citizen in general and for Croatia will outcome from uh, these, um, uh, these programs. I was one of the rapporteurs, so I hope that uh, they will be successful and real, bring real benefits. Uh, and I remain optimistic uh, that we have made a significant step in the right direction. And I wish you here a very good conference and uh, uh, stimulating discussions that, that, and that you still have some time also to visit and enjoy Dubrovnik. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professora Carvalho, for a great insight into funding we're all going to need to make this uh, world more sustainable. And thank you also for reminding us that uh, this is the first Davis conference organized in European Union. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the International Scientific Committee and Scientific Advisory Board that worked the day and night to review uh, the submitted abstracts, of which the conference received 1,120. Uh, from uh, 3,304 different authors. For those submissions deemed as acceptable, authors were invited to submit uh, a manuscript and we have received approximately 600 full papers. Uh, the papers deemed to be of archival value uh, were then reviewed, of which 266 were accepted as being candidates for further publishing in special, special issues of journals, for which I would especially like to thank the Scientific Advisory Board made of 316 leading scientists who did all these reviews. Uh, in the end, 597 submissions are expected to be presented at conference, orally and as posters. Uh, we are very happy with the fact that this uh, eighth conference uh, created such an interest among researchers, making this conference the most successful up to date. The first four conferences were having 100 to 150 participants. The fifth one had 320 and the sixth had 400 20 participants, while this one will have 560 participants. The participants are coming from all six inhabited continents, from 62 countries, 290 cities, and over 350 universities, institutes, agencies, academies, and companies. While being a truly gl global conference, Aid Dubrovnik Conference has strong regional elements. Uh, Based on the presenting author institution, 405 participants out of 560 are from Europe and 123 are from Southeast Europe, the region where we are now. Uh, so you see the, the flags here from 62 countries. Uh, we were expecting that uh, European Union emission trading system will cover this year the air travel to Dubrovnik by uh, uh, the emission trading system, but uh, um, uh, that was delayed for non-EU travel until the next year, so we didn't do offsetting this year. Uh, if you remember, we did it uh, in previous conferences. Uh, but I hope for the next one, uh, uh, air travel will be fully part of emission trading uh, system. Meanwhile, we have uh, gave up on publishing a printed book of abstracts because uh, many people just leave it in the hotel, it's heavy to carry it, and it's uh, unnecessary because we have moved to a more digital uh, 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 world. Uh, so we are now uh, uh, having only a digital book of abstracts. But interestingly, we have only saved 170 kilograms of CO2, not too much because our book of abstracts before was very sustainable. It was uh, made from uh, recycled paper. So, uh, but we did uh, this effort not only to reduce uh, 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 our uh, uh, impact on the environment, but also to uh, uh, make your life easier. I would especially like to thank um, all of the members of the organizing committee who made this conference possible, in particular the conference secretary Zvonimir, uh, who was answering your... Uh, 
who was answering your numerous emails. Uh, Daniel, I think he is there, yes. Uh, who tried to satisfy all your wild wishes about programming. You know, uh, <laughs> you had many of them. Goran, our man in Dubrovnik. Marco, our back office guy. Nevena, she's not here because she's uh, at uh, the registration desk at the university, but uh, who tirelessly worked on visa and financial issues. <laughs> Tomislav, our staff whip, he is not here because he's whipping the staff somewhere. <laughs> uh, Milan, our nightlife organizer and matchmaker. and uh, all others who are now here with us and helping us that everything functions well. I would like to uh, remind you of the strict policy of the conference, that only those papers presented by registered authors at the conference will be deemed published. It is uh, a way how to protect authors who uh, uh, participate in the conference. Also, the participation of the sessions will be strictly limited to the registered participants wearing this accreditation, starting from uh, the lunchtime. So, um, as well as uh, the access to conference uh, excursion, gala dinner, technical excursions and conference lunches will be limited to those in possession of tickets uh, delivered to you at the registration. Uh, there will be a um, 30 minutes uh, coffee break now, uh, and then the first uh, plenary keynote uh, speaker, uh, Professor Jung, will uh, uh, give uh, 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 a lecture, and then there will be a poster session overview. After the keynote lecture, lunch will be served at the university. Uh, those that have not registered yet, please register during the lunch break. Uh, since uh, the weather is good, uh, we would kindly ask you to, uh, for a sustainable walk to the university following our signs. But for those who uh, need or prefer transfer, there will be also buses uh, to take you to the university. Enjoy uh, the coffee break. Thank you. Yeah.